everyone and welcome to Chatty AF, the Anime Feminist Podcast. My name is Amelia, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Anime Feminist and I'm joined today by Dee, Alexis and Isaac to talk about All On High School Host Club. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Dee Hogan. I'm the Managing Editor at Annie Femme. I also run the anime blog The Jose Next Door and you can find me on Twitter at Jose Next Door. Hey, I'm Alexis. I'm an amateur writer and you can find me on Twitter at Alexi Lulu. And I'm Isaac. I'm an associate features editor editor for Crunchyroll. I run the anime blog Mage in a Barrel, and you can find me on Twitter at iblessall. I just want to pull Alexis up on calling herself an amateur writer. Uh, <laughs> that is not a thing. You're a writer. Look, yeah. End of story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're here for the second part in the All Around High School Host Club Watch Along. So a watch along for the unaware is where we watch six episodes at a time. And then as a group, which has at least one person who has seen the series and loves it, um, and at least two people who haven't seen the series and don't know what they're walking into, um, discussing what's happened in the previous six episodes and what they think might be coming next. So it's our way of kind of looking back at slightly older series that maybe have a bit of a a mixed bag for feminist viewers, which today's batch of episodes certainly was. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yes. So this <laughs> this this group of six. Uh, sorry, it was seven episodes we did today because Oran has uh, twenty six episodes total, mm-hmm. and this this batch of seven episodes apparently contains the two episodes that Dee usually warns people about in advance, and she knows that I prefer to go into watch alongs completely unaware. I like to go in completely cold, so I was blindsided by what we saw in this group of episodes. It was. Wow, where to start the discussion? Do we start looking at the gender essentialism or the transphobia or like, what do we pick? I want to start with the gender essentialism, I think, because that like that kind of feeds into the transphobia later on. So it might be useful to start there. Take it away. Just man, the entire beach episode <laughs> is so much from the like just a thousand like bikinis to Tamaki, like, trying to have his cake and eat it, too, by, like, copping out with the, um, the, like, pullover and shorts. Mm -hmm. And then later on, he's just, like, so deeply horny. My boy is so (laughs) excited. And then, like, oh, you're a woman. How can you expect to fight and, like, protect someone? You should rely on us, obviously. Even though that's so, man... And they were nowhere near. Yeah, no one was around. <laughs> and also, like, uh, it feels like it was written specifically to create that tone, and it sucks. Because, like, Haruhi has been shown repeatedly to be... They showed it even later on in this section of episodes, like in the um, Alice in Wonderland episode. Sorry to jump ahead, but Haruhi is extremely independent, and... Like, they just jump into stuff. That's what they do. That's how their life has been. So it makes total sense. And then they're, like, shitting on her for it. And it really sucks. Yeah, completely agree. She's such a capable lead character. And really competent, really calm. And they're looking for ways to tear that down. They're looking for her weak point. And uh, that's kind of gross. That's not not a pleasant way to approach somebody (laughs) at all. Yeah. And then the, like, fight about it later on is so goofy and hackneyed, it feels like. Mm-hmm. It's where like they're not arguing even a about fight. It. <laughs> it's not even a fight, honestly. It's just, like, a baby slap fight that's not even close. It's just, like, two babies, like, swinging arms at each other and not even contacting. But they're next mm-hmm. to each other, so it looks like... It's like... <laughs> this is a stupid reference, but Gravity Falls had a baby fights, like two second gag and it made me instantly think of that because it's just them sitting next to each other and being pagro and then it's over i have to say i quite enjoyed how his response there where she's just like i'm not talking to you and i'm eating all the food yeah suck it like that was i enjoyed that it was very good yeah and then but the fact that she then comes around to it and says you know what you're right i shouldn't have worried everyone like that i'm so sorry and then also the kiyoya in that room and then tamaki right after (sighs) It's so... Yeah. Oh, man. Kyoya kind of getting on top of Haruhi, and then Haruhi saying, oh, it's only because you're so kind. Yeah. I see now that you're even nicer than I thought. <laughs> yeah, that's... It's so Ooh. deeply naive for someone who's been shown to be seeing through everything about them. It 
it almost makes sense, but at the same time, do you really know him that well? Although I did quite like the reasoning of, I know you won't go through with this because there's nothing in it for you. Yeah. And you've shown yourself to be completely mercenary, so... Like, it is it is the kind of insightful assessment of character that we have come to expect from Haruhi. Yeah. But it just also... It was such a... Yeah. yeah. And that's the... It happens twice in these seven episodes that Haruhi ends up with one of them kind of lying over her. <sighs> and it leading to misunderstandings and, like, come on, guys, go to a different well. Yeah. I feel like... I'm hoping that that doesn't become a running thing later on. I know it probably will, but eh. If they could keep the running jokes to the the banana peel, which is already irritating, <laughs> that would be that would be great. That was such a 2006 gag, and I kind of appreciate it for being <laughs> so of its time. But also, come on. It felt like this is this is one of those examples of the feminists read too much into things but that that um the one before the beach episode where they're in this pool and it's called like the jungle pool something and i was just like oh no oh no yeah and it was i was just kind of on tenterhooks that entire episode waiting for really awkward racial dynamics to appear um and they kind of stopped at gorillas and, and bananas so so good for them we could have done a lot worse <laughs> <laughs> that's awful that that's the standard. Yeah. Our bar is so low. We know the depths it could go to, so congratulations on avoiding that. I do want to say, though, one of the things I really enjoyed about this set of episodes is they just packed a bunch of Honey and Mori episodes in here after I complained about them having nothing prior, and I kind of appreciate right. it. I feel like a lot of the stuff we talked about last week, as I hope we see this next time, we got a lot of it, actually. There was some real gold mixed in with the... <clears throat> less uh, appealing stuff. Yeah, like I wanted them to go to Haruhi's house, and they actually do that. They devote a whole episode to it. I, I, For I better or worse. That. What did you think about how um, Honey was developed in these episodes? I I really like characters that can do two things. So like Honey being super <laughs> two whole <laughs> two things. whole things. I know it's a big it's a big step forward for the show because Speaking of low bars. Because Honey had only been one thing before and now he has a whole yes. new thing and that's very exciting. Um he's the dangerous show to come for. Yeah. Like look, I I like <laughs> the idea of characters who don't show their like one trait up front. So like him being both, "Oh, I love sweets" and also "I am a terrifying murder machine." <laughs> is kind of fun. I enjoy it. It is what it is. They even commented on it in a meta way in the episode, right? Where I think it's Dengue is like, yes, this is the Moe we've been missing. Yeah, exactly. When he's getting grumpy about his toothache. Yep. There's a there's a nice sort of uh, appearance reality. I mean, we talked about this last week too, how this kind of keeps coming up in the show about judging people by appearances. But there's a nice little uh, reversal with Honey and Mori this week where Honey is the terrifying murder machine and Mori is the Moe one on the team, it turns out. Yeah. Right. It's good. What did you think about it, Isaac? Yeah. I, I have so many thoughts about all of this. <laughs> um, I guess maybe to to rewind just a little bit and talk about the beach episode um, a little bit more. I, I If you guys remember last week, I said something along the lines of like, there's a lot of like in this show, there's a really strong juxtaposition of like things that are like good and thoughtful and things that are bad. And I felt like that episode <laughs> was like so so much that dynamic um because i think you know like everything else aside i think there is some kind of vaguely uh relevant and worthwhile point in like how he you know is extremely self-independent but she could maybe stand to rely on other people some more and let other people into her life um and you know trust other people and that sort of thing but it's all filtered through this whole like you're a girl you can't fight the you can't fight these boys you have to do sit in this little box that we have of our idea of like what you are there's was like one line that st really stuck out to me in that episode where i think it's tamaki sa says something like you're not being cute and I don't I can't remember what the context was because I didn't write it down but I'm it's just that same same thing again where they've got this like Haruhi, Haruhi girl here is like the platonic idea of a girl that you're supposed to be and she really doesn't fit into it and they're just always trying to like box her in 
Um, you can't see it. I'm like making it like a box with my fingers. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they're trying to like put those, draw those boundaries around her. And, um, you know, they say, like, she's not cut out to be a a heroine. And it's all the same, like, you know, there's these archetypes that people are are supposed to be in and they're supposed to align with. And when they don't, that causes problems within the context of this kind of backwards world a little bit. Um, And so... Like, that episode was, like, I was thinking, you know, I would really like to just be able to, like, get lost in the sort of, like, wish fulfillment of, like, these, like, cute moments of her, like, like flying out to, like, hug Tamaki while the lightning's going on. But there's such an imbalance in, like power in these relationships especially when it's leaning into her he is a girl she's a girl she's got to be cute and girly um and all those things like people falling on top of her and the bed scene is like whenever she's getting boxed in i just get really uncomfortable with (laughs) just all of it because i feel like she these boys that are around her don't feel like you know her friends or her like companions in the club there's like just they're not standing on equal terms and i mean to loop that back around to honey that's part of the i didn't like honey the first time that i watched this but i like him i appreciate him a lot a lot more now because there's none of that in his relationship with her it's just all like fun and like they get along well and he's cute and she's cute and they eat strawberries together i'm like (laughs) this is good this is good yeah, that is and, nice. Um, and Honey's really direct with her, yes. I think, in a way that like the others aren't always. Mm-hmm. Just that that little moment where he kind of said, "Oh, I want to eat your homemade cooking," and there was just no underlying motive to it. He just wants to try how to eat homemade food. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, that that's yeah that that kind of oh, I don't want to say pure, but that kind of <laughs> uncorrupted dynamic. I have no idea how to express it. But whereas with Tamaki, you don't necessarily know what intentions he's got because half the time it seems like he has this huge crush on Haruhi and wants to date her. And then half the time it looks like he's being a possessive dad. And he presents himself in both this ways and it's really complicated. Every time. And there's just not, <laughs> yeah. right. There's none of that with Honey. There's none of that with Mori. Yeah. So and just I can see why Haruhi enjoys spending time with them. Every time he says daddy, I feel <laughs> a part of my soul die. Yeah. Especially in front of her actual In front dad. of her literal <laughs> parent. Like, ugh. Although that episode ends with her literal parent kind of thinking, well, someday she might want to have someone else by her side looking at Haruhi and Tamaki. And he's just told you that he wants to be like her dad. And Like, yeah, man. And it's- <laughs> Ranka, there's so much going on with them, her. I'm going to go with her pronouns just for the record for Harry's parent just because sure. I feel so like grossed out by the way that they treat her from minute one talk about it they so the thing that struck me the most was in the first episode everyone is so dumb and can't read anything that they don't figure out that Harry's a female bodied until like the end of the episode uh, Ranga gets clocked from second one and I feel like that's so weird because Tamaki was easily the least perceptive on that front. And just, it feels so gross and weird that they're just like, oh yeah, that's a... I'm not going to use the slurs here because I really don't feel comfortable even saying it. But that, yeah. That's fair. I would say that I think part of that is because as soon as Ranka walks through the door, Hotter, he says, oh, hi, dad. So I yeah. think that's why everyone goes, oh, this is Haru, he's father. Um but Kaoru and Hikaru, went, they kind of walk in and say, oh, yeah, as expected, it's Haruhi's papa. Yeah, they saw him like, like, they... out there before, so it was like, oh, that's... Mm. I think, yeah, I, I I know what you're saying, Dee, but I think the implication there is, like, this is not someone who's passing. Yeah. And hmm. that, okay. yeah, I, I understand why that's kind of uncomfortable to well, see. Well, aren't they, but hasn't, not to belabor the point, but hasn't, they already know that her mom is, is dead, right, and that she lives with her dad? Yeah, but it's not like she has no other possibility That's of female true. relatives at all. Yeah. Or family, friends, or neighbors. I mean, they just met her landlady. Like, they... Yeah. And it's just, it's especially weird because Ranga is like, 
she is easily like the biggest style icon I've ever seen in this show, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> like she is working looks. She's out here and it's just like, man. It just goes straight and for Ranka Ranka is openly bi, which Yeah. Ki- I was like, that's great. Like it's they're not just kind of setting her up as oh I'm just acting I'm just playing a part it's like no this is somebody who is in the LGBTQ plus community to some extent yeah so in like it possibly it many ways a little less yeah. no yeah Ronka is, like, is very openly uh bisexual and a um I hesitate to say trans because Ronka does refer to her him themself as dad like specifically calls themselves Papa or Otosan so I'm not yeah. sure where Ronka falls personally um, but I mean, certainly, certainly a, a crossdresser, certainly someone who presents uh, in a in a you know traditionally feminine fashion, um, which you know Haruhi is very chill with, and really like other than the the shitty translation of Okama, um, yeah, that it's was a really be my... bad translation. Other than that, everyone's pretty chill about it. You know, like the show is kind of like, oh yeah, that's Haruhi's Otosan. I was actually going to ask, is anyone watching the dub, or are we just on subs for everybody here? Just out of I've, curiosity, um, I have seen sucks. the dub before, um, okay. and I did re- I did rewatch that episode dub just to see uh, if it was uh, better. What or they worse. did with it? Well, I didn't. Rem- I hadn't watched. I actually watched it dubbed more recently than subbed, so I didn't remember the that translation the first time I watched it, and I was like, maybe it's not in the English version as much. Um, they do say it once, and then they switch to transvestite, and they just use that for like the rest of any other time it would come up as as the slur in the subtitles. Hmm. So it is slightly less uncomfortable in the dub, but it's still it's still it's, there. Yeah. It's and there's I can't even be like, well, it was a different time. It was it was ten years ago. It wasn't that long ago, and it was yeah. it was not a great term then either. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a terrible translation. <laughs> Anime translations have a real problem with Okama in general. Mm-hmm. Like I recently noticed it in the Hunter Hunter episode. I think I talked about this last time. Um, and since then, I'm seeing it everywhere and hearing it everywhere and kind of seeing the translations people choose. And they're never the ones that I personally would choose. And it's it's clearly just kind of a, a widespread, an industry-wide problem. And it might be something we have to address at some point because it's starting to get really... The more I notice it, the more I cringe and I just think, oh, this is how trans people have been feeling this entire time, this in, this whole kind of 20-year period or whatever. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's not handled well. And uh, it's it's consistent as well, which I don't appreciate because I think you could have made a case for these privileged, sheltered young boys don't have any kind of sensitivity to them, so they get the word wrong. But then they, uh, Ranka describes herself as working in a bar, mm-hmm. yeah, um, and using a slur. And it's they could have made a case. They could have made a case for using a slur if it had been used by the right people in that scene. And instead, she kind of owns it. And I'm not sure that's true to... I'm not sure that feels authentic. It feels like a translator made a choice. Yeah, I can't... Like, even just assuming that it's just a, like, it's a cross-play thing, that's still some seriously loaded language to just drop. Oh, yeah, I work at that kind of bar. At the very least, I do absolutely love her, like, from the yes. bottom of my heart. <laughs> I love Ronka. Yes, I do. I also adore Ronka, so I'm, I'm glad that you you enjoy her as well. Like, yeah, even, like, even with whatever terrible stuff is going on with the translation, the character themselves is just perfect, so I'm yeah. I'm okay, it could be worse. I am worried about yeah. what they're going to do with them in future episodes, but yeah. Yeah, Tamaki meeting another Tamaki was pretty great. That was very good, and just... <laughs> <laughs> and everyone going, oh, that's why Hari can handle him so easily, yeah. <laughs> like, she's totally used Not to Not just it. that, but like... The ease with which they handle him just like instantly mm-hmm. walks in, sees this, destroys him against a wall, and yes. starts talking shit until he <laughs> makes tea for her. Is it's perfect. I thoroughly enjoyed that whole episode, I have to say. Yeah. That's one of my favorites in the series. Um Shitty translation aside, uh yeah. My yeah. two least favorite episodes are followed by two of my favorite episodes. So it it <laughs> right. helps it, it helps balance the stretch out a little bit. From the start, Haruhi's been pretty chill about everything, and I appreciate that they've given like a sort of understandable reasoning for that almost. Like they were raised mm-hmm. by someone who at the very least presents gender nonconforming. So like mm-hmm. they wouldn't put any emphasis on that. They're just like, whatever. 
I'm hiring you. Absolutely. And I, I thought it was quite interesting that on her day off, she's wearing a dress over jeans. I thought that was quite a nice way of kind of... Yeah. And... Staying on the fence. It also felt nice because it wasn't one of the host boys putting her in that. It would felt right. absolutely normal and just chill. And it was actually like... I felt really weird about the times they have put Haruhi in female clothing for a lot of reasons. But that felt like just normal and really nice in a way that it hadn't before. And yet we have two whole episodes where the boys discuss which swimsuit they're going to put her into and why. And they keep bringing it back because they brought (laughs) in one of the other episodes, one of, um, oh god, what was it? It was the, the blondes, the two characters i can't think of their names the right nekozawa now the nekozawa siblings yeah the nekozawas yeah. um they brought back the bikini like stand oh, so yeah, the, the mannequin <laughs> the mannequin it was like all right come on <laughs> come on we've done this yeah yeah i think the the thing that to me makes a lot of the a lot of the kind of nonsense that goes on with the boys and the gender stuff sort of most of the time why it doesn't bother me too much is that it I would say about 90% of the time in this show, it's, they're very good about um, framing it as Haruhi is, is in the right and the boys are idiots and they're being stupid. And then they frequently, Tamaki pretty much anytime he says something like exceptionally bad, like bigoted, um, he's either like immediately Haruhi, you know, is like, wow, you're, you're the worst. And he gets punished that way. Or cosmically something happens. Like when, he's, when he runs up to the Lobelia girls and is spouting off some bullshit about Adam and Eve, and he immediately trips and gets burned by tea. Like, the universe goes, no, Tamaki, you're in it. Yeah. Stop it. Um, and I think, so I think that's one of the reasons why, like, I, I get why, like, I think it's totally valid if that, that um, if those elements make folks uncomfortable, like the, like the twin cess shit we talked about last week. Um, I think it's valid to say, to, to talk about that being, you know, uncomfortable, but I think that you would be hard pressed to argue that the show is promoting that as an acceptable way of living in the real world. Does that make sense? Like there's, there's kind of a, there's a layer of um, the show going, no, you're supposed to laugh at this because it's wrong, which is why the beach episode is, I think the worst episode in the show um, because it doesn't do that. It, it spins itself back around to being like, well, no, these gendered ideas that, you know, the vast majority of the time the show is saying, well, no, this is silly. People, you know, don't fit into these neat boxes. Um, it falls into that pattern in that episode in a really, really painful way. Yeah, it's like immediately, oh, Tamaki's right. Yeah, the weightlessness, the weightlessness or the sense of like, we're mocking these idiots goes away. And it's really frustrating me because kind of like what Isaac was talking about earlier is I think there are two stories the beach episode could have told and it could have told mm-hmm. them fairly well. One of them is a non is a to- story that has nothing to do with gender and it's just about Haruhi being somebody who's I, independent to the point of being kind of isolated and the importance of understanding that you can't do everything yourself and it's okay to ask other people for help or you know build that community. Um, I, think, I think that's a nice, simple story you can tell, um, which kind of ties back into some of the later stuff, especially with like the Wonderland episode where you do get a better sense of the fact that Haruhi is, is building this, this community with these guys who, you know, she gets something out of that relationship. Um, I think there's another story the Beach episode could have told, which is a very complicated and difficult story about how um, one's, how like uh, your personal, how Haruhi feels about gender clashes up against like societal norms about gender. Um, which is definitely something I have run into as I've gotten older is that sense growing up where I was like, well, I mean, don't think of me as like a girl, just think of me as D. Um, And then you run into the real world where people do make assumptions based on, you know, the way you look. And and a lot of those assumptions are couched in gendered terms. Um, That would be a very difficult story that I do not think Oran is in any way equipped to handle. But it is a story that could be told. Um, but instead of trying to tell one of those two, it ends up smashing them together, and it turns into this this really shitty story about how all girls are weak and in need of protection, and all boys are potential rapists. So watch out, ladies. Um, and it's oh, it's it's terrible, you guys. I just skipped this episode. I pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> so. That is honestly fair because man, there's not a lot to be gained from that episode. It looks pretty. It looks it's, pretty. <laughs> it is. <laughs> There's some cute it's, moments in the first half, and then, mm-hmm. oops. 
I even like the I like I kind of like the thunder scene with her and Tamaki just because it's right. like I was I'm fine. Just about to say oh, that. where you go? Yeah, go ahead, Amelia. I've been chatting for a while. No, no, no. I was, I was just about to say that, like that moment where she's like, "No, nope, it's okay. I know what I'm doing. I just have to climb into the closet and then I'll be fine." And Tamaki's like, "That's that's silly. I'm right here. You can you can rely on me as your friend. I'm just gonna give him the benefit of the doubt there. You can rely on me as your friend to kind of support you when you're." in the situation when you're scared when you're feeling vulnerable that was quite nice and they did they did kind of play it straight Mm -hmm. um until they got to the bit where he's just blindfolding (laughs) her and she's going oh yeah this is great you're absolutely right i feel like haruhi would have discovered that herself long ago but never mind yeah but that scene i mean it was it was played kind of shippy Mm -hmm. which i'm i'm not sure how i feel about that since like we have that whole episode where Tamaki's like, I see myself as your father, which I'm, I know I keep coming back to this, but I just can't get my head around that kind of dynamic where you, you feel like, I don't know, I guess, I guess it's inherent. I mean, we see this, uh, this kind of toxic heterosexuality, I guess, toxic masculinity mm-hmm. where men are put in this position or men put themselves in this position of being both partner both sexual partner and kind of protective uh awful father yeah and there's kind of an element i'm not explaining of... this very well but it's it is a dynamic that is in society and tamaki's representing it just really kind of in a cartoonish way but it's based in something real yeah. and i'm struggling with it because it is so front and center yeah i think i think for him to me it comes off a lot as like it's like an affectation that where he can't navigate kind of his own feelings mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. towards Haruhi and so that's for whatever reason is what he goes with um, which is not to say that it's great because every time he does that I like type into my notes Tamaki you suck <laughs> like every time he says that but I yeah I well yeah I don't think he really sees himself as her father it's a, just a really unfortunate way that he's chosen to navigate kind of like wow I have a lot of feelings towards this person yeah 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 I can go with that. It's still really weird to listen to and to see. Oh, no, it, no. It, 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 is. <laughs> it is. And again, I think the fact that he is so frequently either punished by the other characters or by the universe uh, shows that the show is is in some ways like kind of trying to push him away from that. But no, I, I, I agree with you, Isaac. I think Tamaki has no idea how to navigate his feelings for Haruhi. Um, so he frequently will couch them in what he what he consider what what are more like acceptable social norms like well no it's like a family i'm just looking after her or like when he gets all hot and bothered about the swimsuit he can't admit to himself like i think her he looks really cute in a swimsuit so he goes no young ladies just aren't supposed to show their skin to anybody um and then he gets glared at into the floor as he should um but i think it's i think that's one of the reasons why tamaki is a character who i can who i can enjoy uh despite a lot of the bullshit he says because it's yep. it's very much framed as like it's not like like Tamaki does not does not come across to me as like an actual bigot. Um, when Haruhi comes to the club and they think she's a boy, he just immediately starts flirting with her like she's another customer and it's not a big deal. Um, you know he he's pretty chill with Ranka, um, but he freaks out at the Lobelia girls because they might take Haruhi away. Um, like that's where it comes from. So I think uh, I think the show navigates that fairly well not always and we've definitely talked about places where it where it fails at that but i think that's why he's ultimately still kind of an enjoyable clown even though he does say some stuff that's that's pretty heinous he is still my problematic fave. oh no that's I'm fair enjoying every second <laughs> yeah. of him on yeah. screen um and it's it's completely consistent with his character this is a guy who came to high school and immediately set up a host club like that's that's an unusual decision mm-hmm. for a what 15 16 year old boy to take He's so used to playing at relationships and playing at kind of performative romance Mm -hmm. that the real thing, probably he has not got a clue. He hasn't got a framework, so he goes to the next best thing, as you said. Uh, I think that's a really smart way to look at it. And hopefully we'll make it a bit more palatable for me in future episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Can we can we talk a little bit about the Labelia episode? Oh sure, because that that was my least favorite. <laughs> my second oh, least far. favorite episode. So. Yeah. Like I knew I knew we were in trouble the moment you have a girl dressed up as a witch saying we object to the oppressive views of men or something, um, and then later on we have literal feminazis. We have these yeah. women saying yeah. Heil Zuka Club in front of a flag with the the kanji for woman on it. <laughs> it was. 
painful. And then they, they completely fulfill the predatory lesbian trope. And it's the whole thing is covered in like lilies, which are the, the flower of, of Yuri, of, course. of lesbianism. And mm. it's the implications are so deeply unpleasant. Uh, I, fa- I really struggled with this one. It's uh, also just from like a narrative perspective, it's just such a nothing episode. Like nothing interesting happens in it. The only like movement is like we find out how he likes the host club and she wouldn't transfer away from Oron to another place. Like And there is I... things you could have easily we knew I had already. Yeah. There is a hint of something that comes up later there where she's like, I'm here for a reason besides yes. just the host club. Yeah. And I did appreciate that, but that's like a two second thing that could have gone anywhere. So I'm not sure that, it, yeah, I agree with, with that, Alexis. I'm not sure that it serves no purpose because I think this is about the time in the series when I I appreciated the fact that we see that Haruhi is actually expressing agency and choosing to stay. Yeah. How do he is there for a debt, but they acknowledge in that episode that actually she could repay the debt by going somewhere else and just earning money traditionally and giving it to them. So the fact that she then says, no, actually, I want to be here, like that feels like I, I appreciated that. I enjoyed that. Yeah. But and I, I also like the fact that they kind of suggested that there was another place where she would fit in just as well, if not better, where she actually wouldn't have to hide her identity and she could still be comfortable and she could still get the benefits that she currently gets from being part of the host club. Like, that's that's something it was good to see acknowledged. She's been kind of... Yeah. I don't know. It would be, it would be kind of easy to say, well, you won't get anything. You know, if you leave Oran, then you can't possibly recreate the positive sides of the experience you get here. But they made it clear that she could. And yet. But that was the only positive thing for me. Yeah, it's like you could go somewhere else and you could be basically what you're doing here, but you'd also be a lesbian. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing worse, right? Yep. A lesbian with with really fabulous arm geometry. <laughs> <laughs> the way they... Okay, that was... I was really just struck by... I like the character designs in this show in general, but the way that the Lobelia girls stand, like, with just the po- way they pose their arms and stuff, like, super good. I was all, <laughs> I was all about that. I, uh, yeah, I don't I don't like the Lobelia episode, and I, I completely understand why a lot of people think it's worse than the Beach episode. Um, they're, I think they're, I think they're pretty even in, I think they're bad in different ways. Um, the thing that, the Lobelia episode, the thing that saves the Lobelia episode for me is that we are supposed to look to Haruhi for our kind of moral core in this, in this goofball comedy world that we live in. And at the end of the episode, she, she's very, she's like pretty cool with the Lobelia girls. And at the end she says, I think the way you guys live is fine. Like it's unique. And you know, the, the, your Zuka club thing seems, seems cool. Like you guys are not like, you're fine. I have nothing, I have nothing against you. This just isn't for me. I have something else I want to do. Um, and so I think that, I think that is like the one thing that at least makes this not a complete, um, shit show, but (laughs) it's still very bad. Um, I also, there is something, and I think I'd not, I don't want to give the show credit for this, but I think it's, I think I really don't, because I don't think this is intentional. I think it stumbles into a critique of the class S genre that's valid because they sort of present the Lobelia school as, um, like the, I don't know, the Yuri version of the host club, I guess. Um, but it's very much sort of a traditional class S school. And class S is kind of like the tropes in the hopes in the host club, ultimately fake because you're expected to graduate from high school and get over this quote unquote phase and go marry a man. Um, so again, I think completely unintentionally by sort of paralleling um, the Zuka club with the host club, the series kind of criticizes that sort of plastic equality of class S series. And I don't hate that. Um, I just don't think it did it on purpose. Yeah. It yeah. feels totally incidental to their major point, which is, hey, here's the weird counterpoint to the host club. Aren't they funny? Yeah. And then when the ultimate punchline is the host club dressing up as women. Yeah. Badly. It, that was that was the moment where I was like, this episode is dead to me, I think. It was, it was not a good resolution for that story. Like, how did they win her back by making a joke of dressing up as women, which is what her dad does for a living. Yeah, and it came before that episode with Ranga too, so that 
kind of like right. piled onto it. I did appreciate that Haruhi's reaction didn't actually have anything to do with her response to that or the Zuka girls. She's just like, no, that's you guys are being so stupid. I don't care. And stop selling my pencil. Please <laughs> stop selling my pencil. <laughs> I need that. That really annoyed me. I, I really felt for Haruhi there. I was like, you know, Haruhi's working off this debt and can make 30,000 yen from selling a pencil. And they just went ahead and did that anyway. And then she lost a pencil as well as not actually paying 30,000 yen towards her debt. Oh, I completely, I would have been annoyed. Oh. See, I had assumed that that was going towards her debt. Like this was like, Kyoya is just kind of doing it because, hey, they'll pay money for it. Why not? But, uh, you I, know, it's a little... I don't know. I... Yeah. <laughs> they, still, <laughs> they still should have asked her first. Yeah, yes. obviously. And, yeah. That's, and that's really how to, his point is, like, you guys need to talk to me before you do these things. This isn't okay. Yeah. So. And then it seems like it was a big group effort, because then Tamaki's like, oh, yeah, we really should have thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> and how do he's not heard any of this? And then the twins were the ones who actually took it in the first place, so it was like two-thirds mm-hmm. of the club was involved in this. Presumably, Honey and Mori were off, like, eating cake and being... Mm-hmm dubiously had her homosexual <laughs> oh yes Although, are we talking about Mori's confessions now I think yeah that's probably a good chance to go over <laughs> the toothache episode and whatever the hell was going on with the confessions in that episode well what I quite liked about the confessions was that Mori doesn't say a thing <laughs> no, he Mori doesn't. just stands there and this girl projects a narrative onto him and she just takes it full circle and I was like that is exactly how kind of non-canon BL works is you look at a text and you read between the lines and you come to your own conclusions I just it felt it felt smarter than perhaps is, is really yeah. uh, what they deserve credit for but I quite appreciated that fact of it also, that episode was honestly just good in general because everyone being just like, I can't help you, honey, I'm so sorry, was kind of sweet <laughs> because they kind of presented a united front and honey is just so sad. And I I don't know, it was weird. I enjoyed it, even though it was like just a bunch of gags in a row. And I mean, yet... the dead teddy bear gag. The... <laughs> good. Both that times was... that happened. Poor Kuma-chan. I have a Kuma-chan. That was great. <laughs> Poor bear. That that was really great. I loved that. And the fact that Honey, like when you when you take his sweets away, like I, I like the picture they've built of Honey in these episodes where he is actually a little bit more aware and calculating than he presents himself to be. And he is trying to be cute and he's trying to be likable, but when you take his sweets away, that filter falls and he is just a spoiled brat. <laughs> Extremely relatable. I, it's it, God, yeah. <laughs> I, I really like that. It does make him a fully fledged character. It it adds something to the series to to give him these extra dimensions. And with Mori as well. Like, although my favorite Mori moment was actually probably when he says Haruhi's name, and she's like, "I'm slightly happy that you use my name." And it was <laughs> it was such a sweet Haruhi moment. We're not going to get many moments like that of Haruhi blushing, and there was no kind of kind of loaded meaning in it I think it was just the fact that he doesn't normally do it and from somebody that she doesn't expect any kind of intimacy from for him to to call her by her first name was meaningful to her and that was sweet yeah I think they call that gap moe <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> do. I saw a lot of a lot of Moe mentions this episode. I know. When he gets uh, head, this is going back, but when he gets the head pat from Honey, oh, oh. that was so good. That was very cute. <laughs> And also, Honey just decking the crap out of him with the judo throw was pretty good. Yeah, Honey in general, these episodes, I I really enjoyed him. I keep thinking of him as Momiji from Fruits Basket. (laughs) I keep kind of forgetting that he's a character in his own right. And these episodes went some way to helping that, I think. Yeah. I think we probably need to talk about the Haruhi in Wonderland episode. Because that was a complete departure yes. from anything we've yes. seen oh, and good. it ended on such a serious and and meaningful such note. a good episode before we do real quick because i think that's probably where we'll um i would imagine that'll wrap kind of be where we wrap yeah. up since it was the last episode um mm-hmm. i just want to say that the nekozama family is so good and pure uh did yeah. you oh i totally forgot <laughs> about them oh that episode i struggled did you I really did not enjoy that one oh, i love yeah, that episode i know i love the i love uh uh, Umehi, I just call him Nekozawa. I love him and Kirimi and the 
and her like show genre savvy the the whole like yay there's debauchery here is like an ongoing meme <laughs> and something my friends and i will say to each other like if we're watching anime we'll be like it's a reverse harem yay oh my I god i hated that moment <laughs> <laughs> I cannot stand precocious children. It was too much for it's me. It's not her fault she's been indoctrinated with shoujo manga. Yeah. Yeah, My I didn't find her, her I didn't fault. find her precocious. I just thought it was I just yeah, it was like she's they've been reading this to her and so she's aware of these of these uh these like genre elements. I got to say I didn't, Haruhi's didn't work for me. like dead like utterly lifeless reading of shoujo manga tropes in that <laughs> 5 second <laughs> scene was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I really like I like when the show goes into um I think it does family uh dynamics well and I like just the idea of uh these two siblings who uh are struggling to kind of connect and then they find this sort of goofy ridiculous way but then at the end she acknowledges him as her brother and is just so sweet. I like the Nekazawas. Yeah. Right. Well, it's it's the whole like you have to accept people for who they actually are, not the archetype they're supposed to be in your head. Like, it's a really clear example of that message because the whole, like, issue that's between them is, like, she has this, like, idealized version of, like, oh, my brother is this, like, golden-haired prince. Like, this is who my brother is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And the resolution of the episode is, well, no, she doesn't accept him as that, even after Renge comes in with all of her, like, otaku know-how and tries to reform him yeah. by an archetype into an archetype but no what really at the, at the end of the episode she's like i it's fine that he is not this trope that i wanted him to be mm -hmm. that i was told he should be by all the shoujo, shoujo manga the maid read to me i like him because he's my brother and he risks you know coming out into the sunlight that he can't stand um, and that's like what builds the bond between them. So it's like a really clear articulation of that theme that's kind of been going on, but in a really self-contained episode. Exactly. Very well put. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I did appreciate just having a chance to kind of step back to the episode two dynamic where it was like, oh, these are two people who have just kind of shown up in the host room and now we're mm -hmm. going to fix their problems. Yeah, I like it when the host club helps the other students. I think that's I yeah. think that that's also where you see like Tamaki's sort of best side is how much mm -hmm. he genuinely wants to help other people be happy. Right. Yeah, it's that I I think I said this last week, but you know, he said he again he says like, "Oh, we got to make the little girl happy. We, our job is to make the girls happy." But in so doing, they really make everybody happy regardless of whether they're, you know, girls or guys or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is good. Okay, that's all. I just wanted to touch on that episode because it's one of my favorites. I watch that one when I'm having a bad day because it makes me smile. That's adorable. Yeah, it's a cute one. <laughs> I, I can see why. It's that one. It's that one, the one where they visit Haruhi's house. And then those are like the two, those are kind of my two go-to, like I'm having a bad day and I want to smile episodes. Um, and then there's a couple in the second half that are just, I think are just really good, but we'll get to those eventually. But yeah, those that's back to back two of my favorite episodes. Yeah, it, it never ceases to amaze me how our tastes sometimes are the same and sometimes they aren't the same. Like, I love the Haruhi's House episode. I, would have, I was so bored during the Nekozawa Aww. siblings <laughs> episode. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 50-50 success rate. That's not bad. Yeah, hey. <laughs> but we all liked Haruhi and Wonderland, right? Yes. Right? Probably. Uh, I did. Oh, no. I think Amelia uh -oh. struggled okay. with it a little bit, which we can we can go into. It's this is The Wonderland one is one that I've seen the show multiple times. I don't think I ever really appreciated The Wonderland. Like, I, I never disliked it, but I don't think I ever really appreciated it until this watch through, right. whereupon I almost got, sh like, I got choked up at the end and did not expect that. Oh. Um, it's, yeah, no, uh, it's it's really, really good, and I don't know if I ever really got how good it was until this this time through, so... Amelia, yeah, it's, would you like to I, kick us off? I can't stand Alice in Wonderland and anime keeps going to this well and just loves telling stories about Alice in Wonderland style. Um, so that's always an instant oh no for me. Um, and I struggle with kind of more surreal stories like yeah, Oran usually the yeah the kind of surreal that they do usually is fine it's like within my tolerance level and this one went over it. However in the second half of the episode, once you start realizing they're actually telling something, they're telling a real story. They're not just yeah. throwing the elements there for the aesthetic mm -hmm. or like as cute filler. Once you realize that it actually serves a purpose, they're doing something important and it ends up on this really touching 
kind of moment with Haruhi and her mother and I'm uh, assuming her goal is to be a lawyer like her mum mm-hmm. um, like that's because it, it was in this episode that I realised hey she's mentioned that she she came to Oran to do something specific I just started thinking about that kind of opening credits of this episode and then they went instantly answered my question <laughs> so I, I love that they chose a different way to do it it was a way that kind of didn't work for me at first but now I know what, what it's leading up to I think a rewatch I, I get a lot more out of it mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I appreciate how much they mess with it. Just like it's sort of like they're leaning on it just a little bit, but also it's mm-hmm. not like it's clearly not that this is the entirety of the story. They're using these yeah. elements, and I really appreciated just the like the entire ending scene where she runs out and is like, "I'm this person's lawyer. Let's go." It was really <laughs> sweet, just because it's Haruhi being like, "I'm." I'm an independent person. I'm going to fix this. Yeah, and I loved, I loved her getting stuck in a vase. Like, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> they, but I love that the, the kind of slapstick comedy that they do. Like it, it didn't disappear. Yeah. So the show didn't lose its personality, even though it was telling an Alice in Wonderland story. So it was, it was fine. It was fine. And I think I a rewatch would completely clarify. I think for me, what would be good about it? This episode was, gosh, I'm. Hey, listeners, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. Um, It's not 100% anime original, but I think a good chunk of it is. I think the original was just, I think they just kind of did a silly little Wonderland cosplay in one of the episodes. Um, So I think this episode gives you a a pretty good idea of why I like Igarashi as much as I do, is the combination of really striking storyboards, number one. Uh, Two, that combination of sort of like broad, endearing comedy with, these sort of sudden turns into taking those taking those things that have kind of endeared you to the character and then sort of shifting into more serious um, kind of emotional beats with them and not really not really skipping a beat like very smoothly uh, shifting between those two um, and I thought this episode did that very well as, as you're going into it, you're like oh we're getting kind of a more inside look into Haruhi's mentality which Haruhi's not somebody who like super duper emotes like she kind of reacts to everybody with like mild annoyance a lot of the time um so and so i think there's there's been that sense like we talked about this a little bit last week of um what is how he getting out of this relationship like we've seen how some of the other some of the other uh boys in the host club have uh, especially like the episode with the twins are getting something out of their relationship with Haruhi, but what is Haruhi getting from this? And I think this episode goes a long way in showing that, yeah, Haruhi, you know, gets irritated at them sometimes, but she is she is enjoying herself. And they are giving her something in her school life that she's maybe never had before because she's been fo- so focused on just like studying and going to school to, you know, fulfill a goal. And I really like that that aspect of, of the host club as a community, as kind of a family for all of the characters in it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of clever because in a way there's like some sort of like recappy elements to this. Like we hit mm-hmm. on some of the emotional beats we've had, like where she recognizes that the cat is actually two people. Um, and there's that moment kind of similar to the twins episode where they're like watching her together as she walks off mm-hmm. and has identified, you know, it's two of you, not just one of you. And you're like, oh. I remember that and you like sort of it just calls back to that in a really gentle way in the midst of this other kind of ongoing narrative so as sort of like a metaphorical summation of her journey through the club and her relationships with these characters so far um, I really liked it for that and Mm -hmm. besides the fact that it just it's so striking visually yeah Um, Yeah. and yeah I completely agree that it's like these really like pretty things like all the stuff uh, by the pool with those like reflected shots are just gorgeous Mm -hmm. but then we also have the comedy like the three two one banana um, light show as she's (laughs) running through which is like (laughs) oh so it's just it's extremely you know Igarashi's style to do something like that in the in the arrows and everything it's just ugh it's like, yeah, I I like it because it's like, I it's just stands out to me. Like he did, has so far has storyboarded the first episode, the eighth episode and the 13th episode. And it's just so obvious when he shows up um, because his style is so, so much of a departure from everything else. And I should stop now before I like go all <laughs> soccer, the nerd. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Yeah, are we going to get any more episodes like that d no details but 
Is that is that kind of a one off or like the the full on like sort of magical dreamscape type yeah, episode taking you out of the everyday life for the majority of the episode is that This is um I mean there's there's a there's a couple of sort of like there's some metaphor stuff they do in a couple of the other later episodes which they've they've done the visual metaphors earlier too so that's mm-hmm. not that's not really new No this is the only episode that is like completely within a character's head like it's the only dreamscape episode so it makes a nice i think it also makes like kind of a perfect midway point for the show like it's a very Mm -hmm. kind of surprising departure and then we sort of go back to the regular but it's a nice touchstone for where haruhi is as a character it gives you some more background information with her um i also love that uh sorry i feel like i'm talking about this one a lot um so so please jump in y'all if i'm if i'm going too much um (laughs) I like, I really love that it presents, and again, this was written, at this point in the manga, we were probably like at like 2004, and the anime was 2006, so the timeline there. Um, I remember being surprised when I watched Oron, and not really, and it kind of, I was almost surprised that I was surprised, because while watching it, and how are he talking about her, you know, working lawyer mom, who she idolizes and wants to be like, and, you know, is, um, I don't think it's a spoiler, Amelia called it, to say that, yes, she's going to school to become a lawyer, like her mother. And the show, and I realized while watching, I was like, huh, her mom isn't a housewife. Because that's just a lot of a lot of anime and manga um, in, the early, in the early to mid-aughts, um, and before that, you know, um, that was sort of the expected path most mother characters were well either dead uh, which Harry's mom is also dead but that's but <laughs> but they were you know and and that's and you know that's not to that is by no means to to uh put down housewife characters by any stretch but just like I was sort of struck by oh we've got a shoujo heroine whose mom was also you know who had a prof- who was a successful professional woman who she is you know sort of striving to be like and that was new and different and very exciting to see. Um, and I like that this episode sort of engages with that in the sense that like, um, when they're, when they're yelling at the Duchess about like, you left your kid home alone. How dare yeah. you as a mom? And Har, he's like, no, that's shut up. You're wrong. Um, you know, uh, the, the career is just as important as the family and, and the kids can understand that and you can balance those two things. And, like, I think, again, I think in 2018, it's maybe not quite as resonant as it was in 2004, 2006, but that was kind of a big deal. So it was, I think, I think, uh, I really like that Oran sort of explicitly addresses that in this episode. Yeah. And it's so, when you remember that it's her mom who is the queen, who is doing the one accusing the duchess, Mm -hmm. who is like a stand-in for Haruhi's mom in terms of what she's being accused of, and then Haruhi comes in and defends the duchess against her mom, who is really accusing herself, and she stands up for that, and then they have that moment at the end, like... It's kind of twisty and complicated, but that like moment of emotional resolution is really powerful because it's like she's saying to her departed mother, you know, like, you know, maybe your spirit or whatever in my dream has, you know, some guilt over choosing your career rather than always being there for me. But that's something that I'm okay with. um, And it's something I look up to you and that's impacted my life. And now I'm trying to kind of follow in your footsteps. Um, yeah, I mean, I can understand why you would be choked up at the end of that, because that's really, that's some cool and really powerful stuff. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. So we should probably start wrapping this up. Um, let me ask you, where do you want to see it go from here? In the next, we're doing seven episodes next week. So in the next seven episodes, what do you want to see out of it? Alexis? I really want to see more of Kyoya and Tamaki's, like, We've gotten some of their, some of Honey and Mori's backstory, just like, even if it's just kind of superficial, but I want to see more character episodes of those two, just because we've gotten pretty much everyone else at this point, and I really want to love these boys, but I haven't had much of a chance to. Mm -hmm. So I really just want to see, especially Kyoya, I want to see what the hell is up with this guy. Like, what makes him actually tick besides money? Because... It's obvious that they're going for more than one character trait per person. So I want to see what else this boy can get into. A whole two character yeah. traits he's owed. I mean, hey, we're a dating sim. Yeah. We have two character traits. And we're going to hammer them to hell and back. Yeah. 
Megane kun. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to see that also, I think, especially because we had that moment where Haruhi's like, there's no merit to you in, in sleeping with me, essentially. And he's like, huh, that's a really interesting way to look at it. <laughs> it was, it's like, yeah, there's more going on here. Let's see some of it. How about you, Isaac? Yeah, I, th- I think that's pretty much what I want as well. And not just for those two, but I, I feel like there's grounding for the show just to dig in deeper to all of these characters and draw out some more of, even while it holds true to kind of its comedic nature, I feel like there's still more depth and kind of emotional resonances that it's capable of pulling out of them. So I'd, I'd like to see it do that. I don't know if it will, but if it if it goes there, I would be very on board with that i feel like it's starting to i feel like it's not it's it's not settling for the surface level only it is giving us a bit more so i feel like hopefully sorry i the (laughs) um the alice in wonderland episode really did feel like a turning point in terms of emotional resonance so i'm curious to see how they deal with that going forward yeah how that how they build on it they i don't want it to be like just a an episode out of time where it's it's the standalone episode that you look to but then they don't do anything with it i do hope they build on that mm-hmm. yeah so i'd quite like to see we've talked about it a bit today that this this kind of dynamic of haruhi doesn't rely on people and tamaki doesn't know what he's doing with haruhi like i would like to see that move towards some kind of resolution i would like to see haruhi find a way to rely on people or start seeing a path to finding a way to rely on people in a way that feels comfortable for her on her terms Mm -hmm. rather than just ticking gender essentialist boxes of how women should behave around men and i'd like to see tamaki kind of be a little a little less divided between the the potential boyfriend and potential father figure i'd like to see that kind of become a bit more cohesive I guess, and for him to show some kind of self-awareness. It sort of seems like the the twins have a crush on Haruhi and they're like totally comfortable (laughs) with that. Um, That that hasn't really been openly acknowledged, but that seems to be the way that Tamaki views them as like potentially like- Potential rivals. rivals. Yeah, yeah. So I'd like to see them kind of hash that out a little bit, I think, and just kind of figure out where they all stand. I like things to be quite complete and straightforward. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I don't know if I'm going to get that from this series, but I would like to see a little more in that direction, I think. So, um, okay, D, mm-hmm. has anything surprised you about our discussion today? Or is it pretty much what you expected from this batch of um, particularly mixed episodes? This is pretty much how I thought it was going to go. Um, I was <laughs> When I looked at the episode list, I was like, oh, dang, both the bad ones are going to be in the same podcast. <laughs> Get it out of the way. I thought yeah. they were stag- I thought they were staggered more. So I was like, well, we're gonna have a lot to cre- to, to critique in one podcast for sure. So, uh, yeah, no, that went about the way I thought. The two worst episodes were also the two worst <laughs> episodes for you guys, and you enjoyed how uh family and the yeah. I think really again, it was one of those things where watching it, I was surprised that the the Wonderland episode kind of. I had not realized there was as much meat to it as there is. Um, so watching it, I was like, oh, we'll have a lot to talk about, and we did. So. Yeah, I can't. I still can't believe that I thought that we would have nothing to discuss in an Auburn High School Host Club podcast. <laughs> and when we, when you proposed the watch along, and I was like, "Ah, oh, will there really be enough?" Wow, I was so wrong. I misjudged this series immensely. So yeah, very excited to see what comes in the next seven episodes, episodes fourteen to twenty. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you've enjoyed what you've heard here today, you can find more of our work at www.animefeminist.com. You can find us on Twitter at Anime Feminist. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Anime Fem. We have a Tumblr, animefeminist.tumblr.com. And of course we have a Patreon. I'm very pleased to say that we broke even last week, which means that we have enough money to pay people for everything that's currently going out so all the the work we've been doing for the last 18 months we're finally at a point where we're not going into a deficit to pay for it which is like probably more exciting to me than anyone but this is what i've been working towards since september 2016 and it's i'm so pleased that we've got here so thank you so much to all of our patrons and people who've supported us it means so so much and it does enable us to continue our work And we are going to be still looking for more money because we would like to create more content. We're not even putting out a post a day yet. 
So if you would like to support us and see us do more work, create more content for you, go to patreon.com slash anime feminist and send us a dollar a month. It all adds up. Or if you send us $5 a month, you get access to our private anime only Discord server where you can kind of be in a chat room and talk about the kinds of things that we talk about without having to worry about explaining feminism 101. So thank you so much to Alexis, Isaac and Dee. And we will be back next time with episodes 14 to 20. Watch out for banana peels. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta end on something. <laughs> so that's what I end <laughs> on. Maybe, that, maybe that's just our catchphrase. Yeah, that's that's Annie <laughs> Fem. Watch out for banana peels.